If you watched my previous video on installing this Victron Multi Plus 2 with two SOK server rack batteries, I was able to run my refrigerator for four days. It is a great starting level battery backup system. But now I wanna expand. I wanna be able to run 120 and 240 volt loads. And because I started with this Multi Plus 2 and these server rack batteries, it's very easy to expand by just adding additional modules. So let's clear this out and get rolling with the upgrade. Welcome back to Projects with Everyday Dave. My first goal with this expansion is to be able to run my entire emergency panel with both 120 volt and 240 volt loads, such as my well pump. Second is to be able to charge my batteries from mains power or generator power. And finally, to have significant increase in battery capacity from 10.2 kilowatt hours to 25.6 kilowatt hours. When I built my house, I installed this transfer switch and sub panel for all my emergency circuits. So I can simply insert my battery backup system between the transfer switch and the sub panel. That will allow me to feed the inverters with both mains power and generator power. And I can have the inverters automatically turn the generator on and off in the event of a sustained power outage. The inverters will guarantee the emergency circuits will never lose power. They can pass power through from the mains or the generator, and if those aren't available, they can take power from the batteries to supply the sub panel. That will allow me to have a lot of options for powering my emergency circuits, and I don't have to worry about losing power if I'm not in town. My refrigerator, my freezer, my security system, all of those systems will always be running. If you're trying to build a similar system for completely off-grid, the differences would be you could supply the inverter directly with your generator power and you wouldn't need a transfer switch to switch between mains and generator input. So you could just eliminate this portion of the install. Even though these units are very heavy, because of the simple hanging style brackets, one person can set them fairly easily. They hang securely on the brackets and the bottom is secured with just a couple more screws. To connect the battery and inverters together, I decided to go with the Victron Lynx distributor. And at first I thought, ah, oh, it's kind of an expensive way to connect everything up. But when you consider how much it simplifies all of the things that need to go together, it starts to make a lot more sense. Within the distributor, there are two main bus bars, one for positive and one for negative. And there's a space for fuses. So I can put a mega fuse in for each one of the inverter conductors that I'm installing. These blocks open up, allow you to feed the negative cables in underneath, and then these covers drop down, and then the positive cables in from above for a very neat distribution of cables. And later, if I want to add solar, I can connect the solar input to this as well. If you use the entire link system, then it will monitor the fuses and you can know if a fuse goes out or something like that. But in our case, we're just gonna use it as a distribution block. I need all the cables for the inverters to be the same length. And I made the first couple so that I could position the distributor in the right spot. That way I can get them laying out just about right. I can mount this to the wall and then I'll put the other ones in and they should line up without a problem. Be sure to install the battery cables in the right order. Cable, then flat washer, then lock washer, and nut. The torque values are slightly different for each connection. For the Victron inverter end, the torque is 12 Newton meters, and the torque value for the Lynx distributor bolts is 14 Newton meters. For the positive cable, place the fuse in first, then bolt the cable on top of it. Victron recommends placing fuses in the blank slots to maintain green fuse okay lights in all four positions. Now that the inverters are connected with equal length conductors, I can replace the cover. All right, I've laid out all the parts. Now I can just put it together. We'll start with the vertical rails and the crossbars, and then we'll add in the guides for the batteries. You can tell the bottom because it has a hole for mounting to the floor. The crossbars face smooth side up. All the screws should be temp set at this point to allow alignment of the rack once it's fully assembled. Now that we have the two ladders built, we can put the guide brackets in. The battery support rails sit on top of the crossbars with the angle facing up to support the bottom of the battery. I attached one to the top and bottom of one ladder assembly to use as stabilizer, then connected them to the other ladder assembly. From there, it's very easy to just set in all the battery support brackets and temp set all the screws. Okay, that's pretty quick and easy. 
all the screws are still loose. So now I can make sure that the whole thing is perfectly square. Then I'll tighten them all up and we can load it up. I simply used a square to ensure the rack was plumb and square, then tightened all the fastener. With the rack fully assembled, you should put it in the final resting location and lag bolt it to the floor. That way, if there's an earthquake, it won't move around the building, which could be very dangerous. I, on the other hand, I'm gonna put some wheels on the bottom because I need to be able to move it around for all the testing I'm doing and I'll secure it to the wall directly instead of to the floor. All right, I have some high quality ball bearing casters. They're double locking. That locks the caster and the rotation in one click. And they're supposed to be able to handle over 2000 pounds for the set. So they should be plenty strong for this application. And the bolt happens to be almost exactly the same size as this hole. So I can literally thread it in and then I'll bolt it down from the other side. All right, one problem I see with this is this bottom bracket is just bent over. It's not welded to this channel. So there's a couple solutions here. One, I could go ahead and weld this shut. That will prevent this from twisting or I can put an L bracket on the inside and bolt to the face of this. And I think I'm gonna do that because I don't, I don't like the fact, I mean, I can move that by hand. So with 500 pounds of batteries on that, it's gonna to wanna to twist and I need it to be perfectly stiff. So I'm gonna back that out, put a stiffener bracket in there. In the back of my mind, I know this isn't enough and future Dave is about to pay the price. There, now it is super stiff. All right, the spinny version is ready. And man, that rolls nice. I like it. Yeah, but don't do that. Be sure and bolt yours to the floor. Now I have two batteries from my previous install and they already have the ears connected to them. All right, and then to prep the rack, we just put the, the nuts that come with the battery, squeeze them together and pop them into the holes. And of course, Tyler came up with an easier method to put them in using a screwdriver. He simply hooks one side and then uses the screwdriver to squeeze it together. Set the back end. There we go. All right. I'll screw that in and then we'll put in the next one. The first two batteries, I already had the ears on them, so we slid them all the way in. A convenient way to put the ears on, if you don't already have them on, is to put it most of the way in, then they're at a nice height. I'll go ahead and screw those on, and then we can slide it in. All right, all the batteries are in. Let's see if it rolls. Where are you gonna take it? Nowhere, I'm just gonna see if it moves. Ooh, look at that. Yeah, well, it's over 500 pounds of batteries that I can just... Back wheel. Uh-oh. Crap. And the front wheel. I guess it doesn't work. And that one is also now bending. Okay, turn the video off. <laughs> you can probably see on my face I wish past Dave had listened to the voice in the back of his head. After having a failure like that, I'm a bit embarrassed to admit to being a mechanical engineer. <laughs> Maybe you couldn't tell in the video, but the whole rack of batteries was starting to lean to one side because one of the casters was yielding the reinforced foot and allowing it to bend slightly up. It doesn't take much deflection to cause a problem. I failed to recognize the rack is made of a mild steel, probably around 270 megapascals. And the bearing stress right at the mount surface is too great, locally yielding the tap. There is a big warning in the manual to mount directly to the floor and not apply wheels. The material is plenty strong when used as intended because it has the direct support of the concrete underneath. Current Connected told me they have had people apply casters to their battery racks and the whole 500 pound stack fell over and damaged the batteries. That's enough weight to seriously injure or kill someone. Plus, if you're in an earthquake zone, 
500 pounds of batteries wandering around the room could be a real disaster. So please follow the instructions and bolt it to the floor. To recover the situation, my son Tyler helped me unstack all of the batteries and I added a piece of quarter inch angle iron all the way across from one foot to the other and bolted it to the front of the leg to resist bending in both directions. Then I added an additional quarter inch bearing plate the size of the entire bottom of the foot to improve the distributed load from the caster and resist local yielding at the mount point. After some great exercise, stacking, unstacking, and restacking 500 pounds of batteries, I cautiously confirmed the assembled strength. All right, it's not bending over this time yet. <laughs> Tilting the casters out at a 45 degree or 90 degree angle to the assembly really helps improve the stability. Look at that. Nice. All right. Before I connect all the batteries together, I'm gonna to set the dip switches for which battery is master. I'm gonna use the top battery as master. And that's important because the data from all the other batteries is gonna be sent to one location. And if they have the same registration, then the data will overlap and you won't get the proper communication. So I'll set the top battery as battery number one, the master battery, which is the one the inverter will connect to, and all of the other batteries will send their information to. There is a dip switch chart that shows you which dip switches to set for each battery in the sequence. From the dip switch table, we can see that master is on, off, off, off. So we'll just turn dip switch one on and leave the others off. For battery number two, it's off, on, off, off. So I'll just switch number two to on and so on for the rest of the pack. I can just use a standard ethernet cable, use a short version to connect each battery cascading through the RS-485 ports. Then I can just secure them off to the side to keep it nice and neat. Current Connected makes these convenient pre-made 2 aught cables that are exactly the right size to go from one battery to the next. All of the batteries are off, the breakers are in the off position, and the BMS is off. Because the master battery is going to be used for communication to other devices, I'm going to start with the first negative cable on the innermost post to give me the most access to the top battery port. It's also a good idea to add boots to the end of the cables so that when we have everything assembled, there won't be any exposed conductible surfaces that could be contacted. You want the cable to be slightly longer than the pitch between the two batteries so that there's a little bit of flex in it. That way when things heat and cool, it won't put too much tension on it and cause the joint to come loose. I set my torque wrench to 15 foot-pounds or about 20 newton meters, which is pretty tight. Then I can slide the boots up and that nicely covers our connections. So I'll go ahead and connect the rest of those and we can move to the next step. I keep forgetting to take my ring off. Everyone in the comments keeps reminding me to take my ring off when I'm working on electrical work. And I should also be wearing safety glasses in case there was some kind of arc. I forgot to turn something off, so safety first. All right, there we are, everything's hooked up. Now we're ready to turn it on. If you're using the new budget version, it does not have pre-charge resistor circuit built in and current sharing capacity, so you would want the batteries to all be the same voltage. But in this case, this uh, premium version has the ability to balance the current levels between the batteries, so you don't have to worry about them being exactly the same voltage when you connect them up. So with the BMS off on every battery, and they come shipped that way, but if it's not off, you simply press and hold the RST button until the lights flash, and then you let go, and it will shut off the BMS. So you want everything in the off condition with all the breakers off. Then we can turn the breakers on, and we will start up one BMS, and it will automatically turn on the rest. Okay, with all the breakers on and all the BMS Systems off, I can press and hold the master one till it powers up and boom, 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 boom. You can see they all fire right up. So the, the batteries aren't in exactly the same voltage. This one's at 53.08 and it is discharging at 1.4 amps. And this one is at 53.02 and it is charging at 0.95 amps. So eventually they'll all balance out, but with the individual monitoring like that, you can see exactly what's going on. All right, the system's working. I can connect it up to the computer and check it out, make sure everything's in good shape, and then it'll be ready to go to connect up to our inverter. Now, with the SOK adapter cable, I can plug into the RS-232 port, 
and the USB port on the laptop, you can go to the SOK battery manual page on Current Connected website, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and download the SOK monitoring tool software. Once you install and load the software, pick the COM, which for me is COM4, open the connection, and start monitoring. And now I can see pack one, which is the first battery, the master battery. If I set the pack quantity to FF, and open and communicate. We see that the pack quantity jumps up to five, so it sees all of the batteries. Then you should be able to go to these other batteries and have it display, but I can't get it to do that for some reason. However, if I close the connection and switch to battery two, and then open it back up, it does load the data. So in this way, I can look at the data for each one of the batteries. I can see the voltage and the performance of every cell in the battery pack. I can see the voltage of the entire pack, the current that's flowing in or out of it, its state of charge. And you can see battery pack five is still putting out a little bit of current as it tries to finally balance the entire stack. If there's any kind of problem, it's very easy to diagnose where it's coming from with this type of monitoring. The software to check it is free, but you do have to buy the cable to connect to it. All right, let's check the voltage. All right, we have 53 volts. The pack is set up and ready to go. Now I can shut it back down and we'll be prepared to connect to the inverter. Shut the system off, we'll turn off all the breakers, and then hold down the RST button, and that will shut off the BMS, and it will be back in a completely shut down state for hookup. Press and hold the button until the lights blink, let it go, and it shuts off. Now they don't shut them all off together, so I have to shut off each one manually. Before I connect power up to the distributor, I'm going to insert this smart shunt. This is a Victron BMV712 smart battery monitor. It's the one with the display. I just mounted the display in a little piece of polycarbonate for easy reference. And I've just created a short piece of one aught cable to connect to the negative battery terminal. And that way I can mount my shunt conveniently on the wall next to it. To connect it up, I'll just use some one inch long, five sixteenths inch stainless steel bolts and nuts with washers and lock washers to tighten it up. I'll just start by temp setting both ends to get the position. There's a couple different ways to hook up the battery pack. Whichever way you choose, you need to make sure that you're applying a load in a balanced way so that the batteries charge evenly. The most convenient way to do that is to take the positive off of one corner of your pack and the negative off the other corner. I have a diagram here that'll show you the different options. I think this is the simplest method for the non-bus bar style. In our case, I have all of the batteries turned off. This has a resistor pre-charge circuit built into it, which we can utilize. There's no power on the inverters, no power on the batteries. I've used a meter to make sure there's nothing there so I can connect up the cables without worrying about having any arcing. And the other end of the negative terminal will connect to the shunt. Now we'll connect the positive terminal to the bottom of the bank and the other end of the positive terminal to the Lynx distributor. Now to just kind of keep these up out of the way, I'll just zip tie them together. There we go. Now while that's connected, I can just connect the display for the shunt. Actually, I think I need to put the battery monitor in there. Darn it. I mounted my smart shunt display in a little piece of polycarbonate up underneath the Lynx distributor just for convenience. There's a lot of extra cord that connects the communication signal. I just wrapped it up underneath. And the other end, we can just swing under here and plug it into the shunt. Then the battery sensing cable I'm going to put here, which is the input to the Lynx distributor. You probably want it as close to the battery as possible, but this is equivalently placed with the negative, which goes through the shunt. I probably could have done with a little bit longer bolt here for convenience, but what I'm gonna do is slide the sensor up through the boot and then add another nut on top of the existing one for the sensor. There we go, a little bit of stretch for the boot, but now that's nicely contained. Then the other end of the sensor goes into the B1 port on the shunt, which we can just push in because it has a nice little ferrule on it. And then we can 
bundle this up and zip tie it on here just to get everything nice and clean. There we go. Now we have power from the batteries, power from the Lynx distributor through the fuses to our inverters. We have a battery monitor connected. Everything's set up and now we can power on the inverters so we can program them for split phase. Now we're ready to turn power on to the inverters so we can program them. To start, we want all of the circuit breakers to be off and the BMS to be off. If it's not off, you can tell by pushing a button and the screen will come on. Then push and hold the RST button till it blinks and turns off. It's critical that everything is off in order to use the built-in pre-charge circuit that these batteries come with. If your batteries don't have a pre-charge circuit, you can always use a pre-charge resistor. Turn the batteries on with the cable disconnected, then put the pre-charge resistor between them for about 10 seconds till it charges, then quickly connect the battery cable. That will pre-charge the capacitors in the inverter for you. But the system has it built in, so this is how you use it. The switch on both inverters is off, everything is off. I'm gonna turn on the breakers. Then I'll press and hold the RST button on the top inverter. You see it blink and come on and every other battery turns on. And now we've charged. And I can see from my clamp meter set to inrush that we had about 30 amps of inrush current in that process, which is no problem. I can check the voltage on my inverter is 53 volts. 53 volts. And I can see from my Victron shunt, which will also measure the voltage for me is 53.1 volts. So we have power to everything and we can move on to programming. The first step is to connect both of the units to each other through the VE bus. If you purchase your inverters through Current Connected and told them you were setting them up in a split phase configuration, they will pre-program them for you. You can skip this step entirely. However, if you need to program them yourselves, you'll need to get the Victron Interface MK3 USB. They make a USB-A and a USB-C version of this. I have the USB-A version here. So we'll connect both inverters to each other, and then I'll connect another ethernet cable to the VE bus and the programming dongle. And from there, I can just plug that into my computer. Now I can turn both units on to position one. And you can see the lights are blinking back and forth between the inverters. That tells you they are not configured to talk to each other, and so we need to do some programming. If we just get an inverter on, then that means that they are configured to talk together in some mode, not necessarily the one you want. If I did not have the communication table connected, then I would have an inverter on on both of them because they would be running independently. So we know communication is working and it's ready for programming. You can get the free configuration software by going to victronenergy.com and clicking on the downloads button on the right hand side. The first item is Victron Connect. Select the version you need for your computer. Mine is Windows. So I'm downloading the Windows file. Download the file, then double click the downloaded file to install the software. When you open the software, it will automatically search for connected devices. If it doesn't, just hit the refresh button. It found the MultiPlus, and when I click on that, I should see the setup for multiple inverters, but I don't. Okay, that didn't work. It didn't identify the two units as being on a system. And I discovered the problem was I need to turn both units on so that it says inverter on with the green light and then connect them with the ethernet cable. Now the lights start blinking between inverter and absorption. Now I know it's ready. And now the software picks up the multi-unit configuration. Now the multi plus two comes up. I can click on that and it immediately identifies that we are on a bus system. So I'll click next, get your password from your point of sale, prepare your system by connecting all the units with RJ45 Cat5 cables, which we've done. We've turned all the units on. So now we can go to next. Two units were found and we wanna set them up for a split phase, 180 degree. The units have to have the same firmware because they haven't been updated, so we wanna go ahead and update them. Okay, it took a couple minutes to update them both. Now they're both updated and we can continue. Now it's asking us to identify and assign line one and line two. So one unit is blinking, flashing both all the lights back and forth. 
and I want to assign that to line two. We'll make that the red wire. When we do the wiring, just makes sense to me logically. Now the inverters are resetting and the configuration is complete. Now I can measure the output to make sure that it's configured properly. I get 119.6 from neutral to line one, 119.5 from neutral to line two, and then from line one to line two, I have 239.0. So great, it's working properly. Now I need to confirm the rest of the settings for these inverters for managing the current into the batteries and from the mains or generator source, as well as all the charging parameters for the batteries. For that, we need another free app from the Victron website, the VE Configuration Tools app. All right, so we'll go back to the downloads page and we'll scroll down a little bit till we get to the VE Configuration Tools. Double click on that and install that, or save that file and install it. Now the important thing is you want to have the VE Configure Tools, the Quick Configure Tool, and the System Configurator selected so that you'll have those available to use. When we're doing multiple units, you need a few more tools to do this. I'm not entirely sure why it can't all be in one tool. Nonetheless, this is how it works. Now, if you just have it open, it'll open the VE Configure tool, which won't connect to our units because it's set up for multiple configuration. And it'll say the device is not configured for a lone operation. And that's how you know we need to go back and open the other tool, which is the VE Bus System Configurator. So we'll click the Quick Start and Auto Detect. Make sure all of the units are on, and they are. They're on and powered up. And it detects our split phase configuration between line one and line two and unit one and unit two. And then you can click on one of the units. It brings it up, right click on that and click on VE configure multi. Now from that, it will bring up the configuration tool and allow you to configure them independently. It takes a few seconds to read all the information off the inverter. All right, now if you got these from Current Connected, they will have pre-programmed all of this for you, but I'm just gonna go through each one of these tabs so you know what the settings should be. I'm not gonna go through every one of the settings, but I'll hit on a few of the important ones. One of those being the AC input current limit, which is currently set to 50 amps, and that's what I'm configuring my system for. I'll have a 50 amp breaker from the mains and a 50 amp breaker from the generator. Now, if you have a Gerbo GX, that will allow you to modify this setting without going into the software. So if you're putting this in a motorhome or you're switching from mains to a generator and your generator can't handle 50 amps, you wanna be able to change this. You don't wanna have to go into the settings and update it. You can do that directly from the screen if you keep this override by remote button click. And then for grid, the settings that come with it should be just fine. On inverter, these are the settings that we're going to use to manage the high and low cutoff points for taking power from the battery. And you'll notice this ground relay one that is clicked off. Now this setting is very important. You can only have one neutral to ground bonding point in your system. So when I have this configured in a split phase situation like this, one of these will want to be selected and the other one not. In my case, I'm going to have the L1 inverter be the ground relay. That means when we are in UPS mode, that relay will close giving us our ground neutral bond for our sub panel. You need to have a ground neutral bond in only one location in your system. And when the mains are disconnected and the unit is running off grid, this creates that one bond for you. So for this one, we'll leave that selected and in a second I'll show you, we'll deselect it for the other unit. For the charger, these are the absorption, float voltage, and charge current settings that Current Connected recommends for the SOK battery. And I'll include all of these settings that I'm putting in here in the support documentation that you can find in the description of the video or on my website. The virtual switch and assistance tab, we aren't going to make any changes in. All those settings are good to go. If you had to make any changes, then we would just click the send settings and we would send them to all devices and all settings for this first configuration. We'll hit okay. It'll send that information to both inverters and then they will restart and all the settings will be set. Okay, so now the settings have been set and I'm going to close this panel and go back to the system configurer and I'm gonna to go to the L2 unit. We're gonna open that one up to the configure multi tool and since we made 
all of the settings sent to all of the devices. This should match what we loaded on the other one exactly. But we have to make one change to it that's independent, and that is unselecting the ground relay. Now, the only change that we want to have different between these units is the ground relay which is under the inverter tab. You can see it's selected here. We will deselect it for this unit. Then I will send settings, but I will only send the modified sending and only to this device. Say okay. All right, so I heard a click because that relay opened. So I know that that worked, but I didn't hear it in the other one. Now our units are configured properly and we can move on to the next step of connecting the AC. All right, now the units are configured properly. I've checked the voltages, we have our 120 and 240. The power for the battery charging and all of its settings are properly set up. Now I can shut this back off, make all my AC connections, and then we can charge our batteries and do some testing. All right, I switched off the breaker, so now all of this is completely powered down. The batteries are powered down, none of this has power. One of the things I really like about this Fluke meter is the little magnetic hanger for it, and I can just stick it to the panel and hang it there for myself. I love that. Now, just to make sure all the power is disconnected, I can double check that we have no voltage across any of our conductors. All right, so let's get this thing redone. All right, we're getting close. I gotta make a few changes before we hook up all of the AC connections. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use some half inch watertight flexible conduit. And I have to use half inch because the three quarter inch connectors are too big to fit on this distribution panel. I'll be using six gauge THHN conductors to make the connections from the inverters to my panels. And by code, I cannot put three six gauge conductors in a half inch conduit. However, because I'm using 50 amp breakers, I can derate the ground conductor to 10 gauge. So I'll be using two six gauge conductors for neutral in line one and neutral in line two, and one 10 gauge conductor for the ground wire. Those three I can fit through the half inch cable and that will fit on the unit. In order to lay this out, I want the same length conductors going from each one of these units to the panel. Because they're sitting side by side, this one's a little further away, so it would seem natural just to make those a little bit longer. But the inverters rely on the amount of current that's being drawn, and that is measured based on the resistance. And if the wires are longer for one than the other, the resistance will be different, and therefore the one of the inverters will be supplying more load than the other. To minimize the risk of that condition, I'm going to take my conduit for the furthest away unit, approximate the length that that has to be, and then I'll make the conduit for the other one the same length, and it will just have a little bit of extra length going on here. Now, some other changes I have to make. When I put in this transfer switch, past Dave was expecting future Dave to apply some significant load in here at some point, and so he put in a 100 amp supply to this from the main panel. However, I don't need 100 amps. The things that are in this now don't come anywhere near that kind of a load. The 50 amps that this system is providing will be plenty for that. So I'm gonna have to derate this. I'll pull the 100 amp breaker out of the main panel, replace this cable with six gauge, and I'll replace this 100 amp breaker with a 50 amp breaker. So I'll have 50 on each side. 50 for the mains and 50 for the generator input. I also need a little bit more space than what I have, so I'm gonna disconnect this panel and move it down just a little bit. Then I'll remove the connection between the transfer switch and the sub panel, and we'll replace that with our entire backup system. All right, let's get to it. Now I can pop out my 100 amp breaker and put in the new 50 amp breaker. We have to make sure that we Keep the interlock connected. All right, there we go, 50-50. Now I can pop my 50 amp breaker in. Then I just ran some 6-3 to connect the 50 amp breaker from the main panel to the 50 amp breaker in the transfer switch. The liquid tight connectors for these conduit are a little bit smaller than the tube itself. 
so it's pretty hard to feed the wires through it. I find the easiest thing is to put the connector on the inverter. And I can snug it up later, but it just helps me lay things out. The other thing is the wire holder interferes with the end of the coupler. So the UL listed version has a deeper chamber for the wiring, which gives you a lot more space to work in it. So even if you don't need the UL listed one, you might wanna spend the, a little extra for that so that you can actually have a little more working space here. I'll make sure that my conduits are the same length. Just lay them out on top of each other and then I can chop them off. Get everything roughed out. Well, that kind of looks like the Borg. I, I don't know if I can be proud of it, but that's what I'm gonna go with. Now that I have my conduits basically laid out, I can go ahead and pull my THHN uh, six and 10 gauge wire through it and wire it up. All right, these are stiff wires and pretty short runs, so I think I can just push them through. Let's give that a try. For this inverter on the end, we're gonna have a red, a white, and a green. They're 10 gauge bonding ground wire, uh, white neutral, and then red for line two in on the second inverter. So I'll just tape those together. Even though there's not a lot of space in here, I'm gonna pull eight inches of extra conductor out of this space so I can bring it out and bend it and put it back in. That will give us room to maneuver if we need to change or cut some wire wires later. You don't want to run them straight up into the blocks. That's going to cause you problems. So we'll get about eight inches there and then I need a couple inches to go up through that guy. And you can see how much harder it is to get the conductors through these fittings. That's why it's easier to run it through the conduit first and then shove everything through the fitting. All right. Lost a little bit. Make sure I got my eight inches here. A little bit more. There we go. All right. And then Feeding it in on the other side, I need enough to come in and up to there. The ground for both units will connect directly to the ground bus. Now the red wire, line two, we're gonna connect to line two for the inputs. And that's this lower lug here on the transfer switch. The neutral for both inverters will land on the isolated neutral bus. Okay, so that's line two. The six gauge wires are pretty heavy duty and they'll slide into these no problem. The 10 gauge one, you might wanna add a ferrule, but if you do, you need to make sure you have ferrules that are long enough. This ferrule crimping set I picked up from Amazon has multiple lengths for each wire gauge. The longest one is 18 millimeters, which is what's required for this connector. There we go. I have to mark the wire at three quarters of an inch or 18 millimeters, and that's how much insulation we have to strip off. And then a full inch will get pushed into the block. To install these, we'll need a very fine tipped screwdriver that will go up into the top portion of the slot. And I will start with the one on the left. What we'll do is I'll put a 90 degree bend, just about an inch in from the end, and then I'll come down somewhere in the middle and bend it back on itself. And I'll put the screwdriver in the hole, which releases the mechanism. Then I can slide this guy up and see the conductor went all the way in. Now I can pull that out and it is tight. So we'll give it a 90 degree bend on the end, flex it about halfway in, put the screwdriver in to release the spring, slide the ferrule all the way in. And that has to be one of the long ferrules, by the way. Pull the screwdriver out, nice and tight. And then for the last one, we'll put a 90 degree bend, come halfway down, bend it back on itself. Release the spring. And then it will easily slide up in. Make sure it's all the way in, pull it out. Okay. Give them a good tug, they do not come out. We have some material to work with if something changes later. There's no direct tension on these. If someone comes and moves on this and these get pulled on, there's length in there that will absorb that activity and it won't risk pulling on these, so good and tight. 
All right, now I'll connect the line in for inverter one, which will be black, white, and green. I'll feed that through, we'll wire it up. First, I'll make the connection to the transfer switch. Probably sensing a theme here, the ground connects to the ground bus. Neutral will connect to the neutral bus bar. All right. Then, line one will connect to the line one side of the output of the transfer switch. We'll tug on everything, make sure everything is good and tight. So now the transfer switch is completely wired. I changed out the breakers to be both 50 amp. I have power coming in from the mains to this breaker, which has a line one and a line two. Neutral goes to neutral bus. And then I have power coming in from the generator, which comes into this breaker, line one and line two. Now line one and line two both connect to these lugs. Line one goes to this lug of both breakers and both breakers line two goes to this lug. So the output is line two goes to inverter two and line one goes to inverter one. Right now both breakers are off, which is a possible position, but if I switch it this way, of course the, the main breaker is off, so there's no power here, but assuming there were, then we would have power coming from the mains. And then if I push it this way, it turns the mains off and turns the generator on. Back and forth, switches between mains and generator for our inverter input. So I can close that panel up and finish up the inverters. AC in for inverter one is the same as inverter two, but we have a black conductor for the line ones. Okay, there we go. That's input for inverter one. All right, now all we need to do is connect the output for the two to our sub panel. All right, this one I ended up cutting just a little bit shorter. So I'm going to add a little bit of length by looping this around inside the box and then bring it up to the input breaker. Okay, both neutrals will connect to the neutral bus. So let's go ahead and connect that guy up here. I have a big lug I can put it under. And then we have a back feed breaker. This will be a 50 amp breaker that is feeding the panel. Line one will come from inverter one. Then you can finish up inverter one, strip three quarters, and then mark the insulation at one inch. So I know I've got it pushed in far enough. All right, final hookup here, the line AC one out for inverter two, which will be a white, green, red, just like the in. Okay, we have line one is the black inductor from inverter one to the top of the 50 amp breaker, and line two will be the red conductor to the bottom of the 50 amp breaker. All right. Everything is wired up now. Inverter two, we have used the red conductor to just make sure that we can easily identify it as line two. We have the in and the out. For inverter one, we use black for line one, line one in and line one out. The neutrals and the grounds all go to common bus bars. And our back feed breaker, our 50 amp back feed breaker, takes the line one and line two from each inverter. Before I put all the covers back on, we'll turn it on and make sure everything's working properly. And I can take some current measurements of, across our conductors so we can see what the imbalances are as different loads are turned on. Okay, now that all the AC is connected with the batteries turned off and the units turned off, I'm going to turn the power on to the inverters and we'll start to work our way back and make sure that everything's working properly. So first I'll give power to the transfer switch. Okay. Okay, got 247 volts there. So now I can turn on the transfer switch and I will turn the inverters on to position one. Right now it's showing low battery and once it detects the mains and the mains are stable, then it should switch over to mains on. And there it goes, mains on and bulk. So now I'm delivering power and I should see 240 volts at our input breaker. So I got 248 volts. All right, so I should be able to flip this breaker and we'll see the lights in here come on and my well and everything else should get power. Boom, lights are on. Ah, feels good when it comes together. <laughs> All right, so. I have mains power running to the inverters and they are supplying the loads to the house 
the well, the lights, all the emergency circuits are powered. We're getting 250 volts at 60 hertz. Now I can measure in DC mode and I should see 50 volts across the battery terminals. Oh, because I have it backwards. Didn't like that. Now, one of the cool tricks about these Victron inverters is they are providing power to the battery port, even though the batteries are off. And what that does is it precharges the capacitors so I don't have to worry about the precharge circuit when I turn on my batteries. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use that just for good measure, but because they're precharged, I don't have that problem. Victron battery monitor is showing 57.4 volts. And as soon as I turn the batteries on, it's gonna start charging them. So I'll turn on the unit and because it already has power, I don't even have to hit the reset. You can hear the inverters buzzing because we're putting out 66 amps here, 30 some amps per inverter. And I can measure that about 35 amps on this inverter and about 32 amps on this inverter. Some slight imbalance there. And the result is 67 amps going into the batteries. So power's coming in, no problem. The inverters are charging up the batteries. I can track the charge. The next thing to do in order to calibrate the Victron shunt is to fill the batteries all the way to 100%. And we also need to modify a few settings so that it'll track everything properly. Now we're pulling full power from both of these inverters, totally maxed out. So the fans just kicked on. It's a little bit noisy. You can hear the fans, but that's only when they're, you know, going full bore. All right, let's measure some other things here. Now I can check line one and line two on the breaker coming from the mains and line one, we're getting 14 and a half amps at 60 Hertz and line two, we are at 18 amps. You can see there's some slight imbalance between line one and line two on the inverters. And that's because not only is it pulling power to charge the batteries, but I'm also back feeding this circuit panel and it's powering lights and other circuits in the building, the well. So I can see that we are putting 1.1 amps on inverter two on line two and three amps on inverter one and line one because the loads on the inverters are a little bit imbalanced. But it's able to both fully charge the batteries and run those emergency panel loads without any problem. So we'll go ahead and let the batteries charge up and then I can shut off the mains power and we'll try the battery performance. Make sure that it's running the well, power tools and all the other things that I wanna run with it without any issues. The batteries have been charging full tilt for several hours now, and it seems like a good opportunity to try out this new thermal imaging camera Top Don sent me. It has some neat features like auto tracking the highest temperature on the screen. In this image, you can see why it's important to connect the battery pack from diagonal corners. You can see by the difference in temperature, the higher current flowing at the first battery connected by each cable. The bright orange color is only slightly warm to the touch. That is a really neat visual. If you wanna be able to visualize the hotspots in your system, right now, if you follow the link in the description, you can clip a $70 coupon and get one for $229. All right, the batteries are fully charged now. It's been floating for several hours, so I know everything's completely saturated at 100%, which is the right time to do all the settings for our Victron battery monitor. The easiest way to do that is with the app. Simply load the Victron monitoring app. It will connect to the unit, and then it will show the current status, and we'll go to settings in the top right-hand corner, battery settings, and these are the settings that Current Connected recommends for this unit. The reason we want to set it now is we need to set the 100% level for the battery. So I'll go in and put 500 amp hours for the battery capacity. You can simply click on each one and adjust it as needed. So the important thing about this monitor is if you ever disconnect power, it loses the capacity of the batteries. Now, if you knew what it was when you turned it off, you can type it in 
and tell it that, oh, right now it's at 99% and it'll be pretty close until it resets. Otherwise, you need it to go all the way to 100%, which we are at now, and it shows 100%, and I can synchronize that to 100%. Now it'll track all the power in and out, and I will be able to know the capacity of the entire pack just from this monitor. That's a really great way to do it, especially if you don't have displays on the monitors. If you're going with the budget version, you really need one of these monitors so you actually know what the capacity of your battery is at any given time some kind of shunt monitoring system. I'm also gonna add one of these Emporia views to the load center. The reason I like using this particular monitor is it actually uses current sensors on each one of the circuits so I can precisely measure what's happening. Everybody always wants to know how much I can run off the battery backup system. So I have my entire emergency panel wired using the Emporia View, and it has current sensors that you can place on every single circuit. So I can exactly map how much energy is being used by each thing. How much is being used by the well, how much is being used by the microwave. I have a special outlet down here that I can use for other loads. So I'll track all of that data. So I will be able to show you how long the batteries last and how much each appliance used during that amount of time. Lots of data coming, this is gonna be awesome. It has been exactly 24 hours. We've been running everything in our emergency panel on these batteries for the whole time. The microwave, the well, the lights, all kinds of different things. And I can tell on the app for the smart shunt, we're still at 75%. So 25% of the battery per day, roughly, four days running just like we normally would for all of our kitchen, refrigeration, well, things like that. So a, a total emergency situation with no solar input for four days. So that's really good. I plan to add some solar to this so that I can extend that life. But the nice thing about four days of capacity, you can have rainstorms and and cloudy conditions or snow or things like that that can block out the sun almost completely, at least around here, for four days for sure. So that sets me up to be able to pretty much run indefinitely with this setup in an emergency situation. So even now we're pulling about 25 amps, 1200, 1300 watts, because everybody's still using stuff in the building. And we've consumed 133 amp hours. Now I can jump over to the Imperia view on the emergency panel, and I can look at how much has been consumed over the last 24 hours. So the total usage is 6.5 kilowatt hours, and the fridge consumed 36% of that. Now I'm kind of surprised. I didn't expect the fridge to be such a large portion of that. Of course, the uh, TV, internet security was number two there. The well drew a pretty good portion, several showers, lighting. Uh, the microwave was only 3%. Now, the microwave pulls 1,000 watts when you're running it, so it's a huge load, and we use it all the time, but it doesn't consume nearly as much power over that 24-hour period relative to the other things that are running nonstop. It's those nonstop loads that really eat into things. Um, then the outlets and, and some various other minor things make up the rest. So that's a pretty neat result. I should uh, pull that together and kind of draw some conclusions from it. One interesting thing about these units is they have a very low idle consumption. And one unit is between nine and 10 watts and the two together is between 19 and 20 watts. So when I was running just one, if you watch my previous video, when I had just one inverter connected, with just two batteries, I could run just my refrigerator for four days. But if I ran just my refrigerator with two units connected, that's gonna consume a little bit more idle standby power because even though the fridge only needs one to be on, they're still both running all the time. Even so, 20 watts is really low. When you compare it to all the other options out there, this is one of the best. Now, you don't have to track all of your appliances and you don't have to track the battery capacity, but these are helpful tools. You can understand where the power is going and in a situation where you really need to conserve things, you can look and see. It might seem like running the microwave is a big deal, but by the data I have, it's not the big deal. The big deal is the running the lights all the time and the refrigerator, that consumes an awful lot of power. So. It's through these tools that you can really understand what your usage is and what you need it to be. It has been a full three days now. The batteries are down to about 20%. 
everyone has been living like normal. My kids stand with the refrigerator open and search for something to eat and take half hour long showers. There was never a flicker or an overload. No one even knew we were running off grid. These Victron inverters with their efficient low frequency toroidal transformers have one big advantage over the more portable all-in-one power stations. They can provide the initial surge current that large induction motors need like the table saw or the dust collector. These tools immediately trip the overcurrent protection on the 3600 watt EcoFlow Delta Pro, but start and run just fine with the three KVA Victron setup that we have installed here. And that includes running simultaneous loads, such as lights and other things around the house. Purchasing your equipment through Current Connected has some advantages. They provide an extended warranty of 10 years for the Victron units and the SOK batteries. They also pre-program your units for you and offer support as needed. If you're doing things yourself, finding all the software and settings can be very time consuming. I've compiled circuit diagrams, torque values, as well as links to software, manuals, and parts in an organized way on my website, projectswithdave.com. You can find everything you need through the links in the description below. I'm planning to do some future expansion videos where I add solar charging and some other features. Meanwhile, you can watch the budget single phase version of this install right here, or one of my other DIY solar projects here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you for the next project.